very happy to be with you today and uh, talk to you about uh, developing innovative extension systems in a rapidly uh, growing uh, global economy in the 21st century. And so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what's happening in terms of extension systems and how we can uh, improve them. And so uh, give you a little bit of background. The key goals in terms of the donor community and, and uh, most of the developing countries is one, national food security, that's very, very important, and that really deals more with the staple food crops, but also improving the uh, incomes of small-scale farmers, and that is also extremely important, uh, particularly if we're going to get them out of poverty and get their kids educated and get them into other types of jobs. And from my perspective, uh, improving extension systems is a key pathway to achieving both goals. And I know extension's not gotten much support, but uh, we need to move forward in terms of how we can really strengthen these extension systems. And as I think most of you know, uh, extension systems have become very pluralistic uh, in the last 20 years, 30 years, and now many of them are competing for resources, and so that's made things somewhat more complicated. So what I'd like to talk with you about today is, is how can we develop innovative extension systems where they can really make a difference in terms of uh, rural livelihoods. And so let's talk a little bit first about what are some of the key functions, because I think in the 20th century, we're primarily focused on maintaining national food security, and, uh, and that is to uh, move into technology transfer, like the old training and visit uh, system that was used, mainly focused on staple food crops, linking research to extension to farmers, and that was the, the traditional pattern. But today, I think we need to look a little differently in terms of what extension systems can do, and that is to improve farm income, and that becomes very important. And that involves not just men farmers, but also women farmers, because typically women are involved in producing more high-value crops and, and livestock uh, systems and things like this. And this has really to do with intensification and diversification of the uh, farming systems. To do that, though, if you're going to go for the high value crops and things like this, then farmers got to get organized in groups, particularly small scale farmers. In the U.S. and other countries, it's not a problem. They can, they can sell to markets because they're large producers, commercial producers. But in small countries, if you only have two tenths of a hectare or half a hectare or something like this, then that is a really important problem that has to be addressed. You've got to get farmers organized, both men and women, into producer groups and get them linked to markets. The other major problem that's going on in the developing world in particular is nat uh, natural resource management. Overuse of water, particularly a big problem, but also not using the proper f fertility and things like this, and these are becoming Im important uh, issues. And so what we now are trying to do is differentiate between product innovation, which is on your left, and process innovation, which is on the right. And this is kind of a new way of looking at extension systems and kind of the involvement that they can really make a difference in the lives of, of rural people. Another important part of it, which really goes on to the process innovation star, side, is, is helping rural women improve the nutrition of their children, as well as family planning, hygiene, health care, getting their kids to school, and things like this. And those are another part what, which I would really classify as process innovations. And so let's kind of move forward and talk a little bit of more about innovations and how extension can play a more important role in that process. And so uh, the way you define innovation is just a new way of doing something. And so typically with product innovations that has to do with reducing cost in terms of your inputs and things like this and increasing productivity and, and profits. And that is also a very uh, important part of the innovation uh, process. But there's also the, the private sector is taking on increasing responsibility for, private, uh, for product innovation. And then in terms of process innovation, no one's really dealing with that very much, except now some of the more entrepreneurial NGOs are really working on, on process innovation. But all extensions should begin to look on those particular issues. And so I'd like to talk a little bit more about process innovations and how it can fit into what extension systems are really trying to do. 
So if you're thinking about process innovations, we're not thinking about just delivering a message, delivering a technology and things like this, but we're talking about extension personnel being more facilitators or knowledge brokers and things like this. In other words, they're trying to get farmers linked to better information, how they can diversify their farming systems, how they can get them linked to markets and things like this. Very different type of extension activity to be carried out. And if you're thinking about process innovations, then access to market is extremely important. In other words, if I'm 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers away from a market, no way I can possibly get my product there. On the other hand, if I'm you know, two kilometers, five kilometers, something like this, then it is possible, for, particularly for high value products that are, that are perishable. The other thing is, what are your local uh, agroecological conditions? Uh, you know, what can I grow here? Do I have water? Or do I have irrigation? No, no irrigation. And then the other thing is interest of the, of the farmers themselves, both men and women farmers. If I only have you know, one-tenth of a hectare or half a hectare or whatever, that affects what I can do, and it also affects you know, what the family has in terms of labor and what they're interested in producing and things like this. And so this has to be a farm, uh, a farm household decision in terms of what uh, is going to be carried out. Key player in this whole process are innovative farmers. And that's true regardless of what country we're in and things like this, because frequently they're the ones that set up the process innovations. In other words, a new way of doing things, identify a new market and things like this. So let's talk a little bit about the key functions of an innovative uh, farming, uh, innovative extension system that's market driven and things like this. And the first obvious issue is is looking at where the markets are at. And so, in other words, if there's not a market, then this is not going to be something that we're going to be doing. And then, of course, the innovative farmers are serving that market. And so that becomes a critical factor. In any particular district, you may have you know, five, six, 10, 15 innovative farmers who are trying different things, working out the procedures and things like that. Then the question is, is the research available in terms of the technologies that can be done. And for most of your horticultural crops, your livestock and things like this, fisheries, most of those technologies are already available. It may not be available to small scale farmers, but they are available somewhere, either in the country or certainly within the region. And in the case of India, we use the, the KVK is very important player in terms of, uh, of developing the, uh, the, the um, process innovations in terms of what products can be, uh, can be organized, uh, uh, provided. Uh, the next step is, of course, organizing the, the pharma groups, starting, of course, with self-help groups, and some of them, we call them pharma interest groups. In other words, groups that start getting organized, interested in something, but don't, haven't yet decided what it is that they're going to do. And so one of the things that uh, we have done in, in other countries is do a farmer to farmer assessment. Frequently farmers are more willing to, to talk to other farmers about what works uh, versus listening to extension or even research. And so if you have identified innovative farmers and take the leaders of those producer groups, that are, those uh, self-help groups that have been organized and take them and, and talk to an innovative farmer. In many cases they'll say, yeah, yeah, we can do something like this and so they're willing to move forward. On the, other, on the other hand, in certain cases, depends on whether male or female, they may not. Uh, but once they decide what they want to do as a group, then they have to be trained, and that's where extension comes in. And they play a critical role in terms of teaching them these new technologies, new methods of producing a, a new farming system, and things like this. And so that becomes very, very important. And then the last step, of course, is getting them linked, linked to markets. That goes back to they have to be organized as groups, and then they have to agree what they're going to produce, and then we've got to get them linked to the markets. And so I think thinking about a very different way of organizing extension system is to follow some variation of this particular approach. Now, let's just switch gears a little bit and talk about what's happening in terms of extension systems uh, in the world. Uh, pluralistic extension systems are now really the common uh, framework in most countries. In most Asian countries, you still have very strong public extension systems. 
But then we have a lot of private sector firms as well as many NGOs. And so it's a very, very diverse system. Uh, but I would say public extension system is still playing a, a key role in, in the Asian countries. Sub-Saharan African countries, very, uh, very similar situation, except that there, I think the public extension systems in most countries are not as strong, and the uh, more entrepreneurial NGOs have come in and are competing for resources and things like this. Latin American countries in the early 90s, uh, most of the public extension systems were dropped, and therefore you have a very variation in terms of what's going on in Latin American countries. And, but in certain countries they are trying to reestablish, like Guatemala, they're trying to reestablish a, a public extension system. Most of your Middle Eastern North African countries are primarily a public extension systems, but all of these extension systems do have uh, certain uh, problems that I'd like to kind of go through and talk to, with you about some of these uh, issues. And so uh, one, one thing that start with is, is first of all, extension, public extension systems has to be more decentralized and bottom up, farmer driven. And so and this is particularly important if you're dealing with the high value uh, crop and livestock products and uh, in terms of the agroecological conditions being very location specific as I mentioned before and therefore you have to figure out what has potential for success in a particular area. <clears throat> and so as I mentioned before, one approach is to identify the innovative farmers who are already producing and marketing these particular products. And then the second part in terms of the structural issues that I'll go into in just a minute is that extension systems have to be farmer driven. And if you're going to be farmer driven, and we take this for granted in the United States, is we have advisory committees at the county level and things like this all the way to the state level. And so you must have some formal mechanism for farmers to have a say on what the extension priorities are. That's absolutely important. And so it can be a steering committee, an advisory committee, and things like this. So let me give you an example from India that I started working on in the mid-90s in terms of the structural issues. In this case, you can see on the left, you have the national, the state, district, uh, block, and villages. You have the Department of Agriculture, Department of Animal Husbandry, Department of Horticulture, and, uh, and Fisheries, and then the KVKs, which is the research side. And you can see that they were operating totally separate from each other, and they're very top-down, and primarily working with, uh, with male farmers. So that was a, a very important problem. So what we tried to do in India, which is now being uh, scaled up across the country, is uh, we created this, what we call the ATMA model, the Agricultural Technology Management Agency. Uh, and so in this case, at the district level, we had a governing board. Governing board was basically uh, uh, composed of farmers, as well as NGOs, banks, and things like this, who made the final decision on what the priorities in the, in the country would be. And so in, rather than operating separately then, what would happen is you would have all your, 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 uh, your um, departments of agriculture, horticulture, et cetera, as well as the KVKs and the Zonal Research Station working together within this ATMA management committee. And then they would have, at the block level, they would have a, a farm information and advisory center. And in that case, again, we had a farmer advisory committee. And so the, the heads of all of the farmer groups would serve on that advisory committee. And we basically said 30% had to be women. We wanted to get women's uh, um, message in this thing. The other thing is the block technology team, again, was the integration of the line departments who were operating at the, at the block level. And then you can see at the bottom where you had the farmer interest groups and the self-help groups that would then serve on the advisory committee and set priorities. And so by making this change and making it bottom up and integrating the line departments and, and research, it made a much more uh, effective difference. And in this case, the work plan would come up from the block level and, and then the funds would flow down because in most countries, the people at the field level have no money. And so in this case, we insisted that the money go down to the field level so that they had the resources to work with. Farmers set the priorities. 
And so it really made a massive change in the uh, extension system.